First slide up there is the mission statement of the fire department. I think it's important for us to truly focus on what we're here for. And um, I routinely look at this and it gives us guidance and direction why we're here. Uh, first slide is basically just our call volume, some statistics. Uh, fire calls last year, 2022, 4,700 calls of service for fire, fire only, and then 12,200 EMS calls. Uh, public education, this aspect I'm actually really proud of because we're di directly feeding back into our community. We're giving our community the tools for them to help themselves and help their neighbors. Uh, we delivered over 30 Stop the Bleed presentations to our community and uh, delivered 40 CPR certification classes to our community as well. And put those together, that's more than one class a week. Very busy in this program, educating our community to help themselves. The next few slides are going to be a report on some projects that we've had over, over the last year that we're kind of closing down. Engine 3 and Engine 5 are set to go into production on the 1st of July. Uh, we purchased these over 15 months ago, and they're just now going into production with a completion date of September, and hopefully these vehicles will be in full service prior to the end of this year. We also implemented a, a health and fitness initiative. And um, this is a, a fitness initiative that we kind of modeled after the Texas DPS. And this plan is a 100 meter road test. And uh, each individual's time is based on their age, their gender, and then also their weight. Um, so our goal for every member of our department is to have a 50% VO2 max. And what's a VO2 max, right? So basically a VO2 max is the efficiency that your body consumes um, O2, o oxygen, and then how your body translates that and uses that oxygen to convert it to energy. So the higher your VO2 max, the more efficient and the more um, athletic you are. So national, about 35 to 40 is the national VO2 max, but for elite athletes like Chief Carter and myself, 85 to 90 is a good figure. And, and about Chief the Carter. city council, what would that Coming number in. be? I just wonder. 35 to 40 is average. <laughs> now keep in mind, we set, the, we set our minimum standard for our department at 50, okay? National average for male is 35 to 40. So we also mandated a, a, a daily PT program. Every day a firefighters on shift, they're required to participate in some sort of PT activity. So um, yearly we did a road test to evaluate the performance of our personnel and we had 100% participation in this road test. And 2021, 94% of our department met that 50% standard. And 2022, 96% met that 50% standard. And we've got a goal in 2023 of 98%. And yes, we do have several of our members that are 85 all the way up to 100 percent and i gave that figure of elite athletes or above 85 we have a lot of really good athletes in our department a lot of a lot of folks in great shape so so we've also increased our tiffness capabilities last year we had one strike team leader trainee that person is now a full-fledged strike team leader and out on the wildland incident scene uh, this person would be in charge of five units with three to four personnel on, in, on each unit. So pretty much in charge of the entire incident. So that is a very high ranking position in the, in the wildland world. Uh, we also maintain seven engine bosses and 40 deployable team members. And uh, we've maintained our REM team, which is rapid extrication module. And with these uh, TIFMIS, that's Texas Intrastate Fire Mutual Aid System, I forgot to tell you all that, but anyways, on this RIM team, uh, there's only about three of these teams across the entire state, and at a certain level of incident, they were required to have a RIM team deploy on this. So we actually went on one RIM team deployment last year. Um, some of our other deployments, uh, we had five wildland deployments. We also had four wildland paramedic deployments. as where a paramedic respond with a uh, four-wheel drive vehicle or an ambulance unit, and uh, they're there for the firefighters on the fire line. Wildland event is a true wildfire that our guys are out there working on different communities across the state of Texas. And then also border support. We have an engine staged to protect a prison. Um, and that, and that pro program has been continual up until this point. 
Is the, How many uh, people do we send down there? So down in the border support, we have eight people that rotate day shift and night shift, 12-hour shifts. And uh, they'll be, they're there for two weeks at a time, and then they rotate back here. Yeah, is the city compensated for the Absolutely. Yes. It's zero cost for the city. Our overtime that the members that are deployed make, the overtime for the backfield to fill those positions at home, and we are also compensated for that for our units that are deployed. So a Type 1 engine receives 70, no, receives $81 an hour when it's on deployment. So my next slide, I was going to come back to this. Well, it was mentioned earlier, which one of these programs, not necessarily my department, but which one of these programs has the highest possibility of generating revenue? Well, I've got two different programs where a fire department doesn't necessarily generate revenue. It's a service for our community. Well, we have found a way to generate revenue in multiple different aspects. Our training center being one of those um, and being members of this TIFMAS program, also another uh, ability to generate revenue. Because of the classes you hold? Yes, ma'am. For all the certifications, you, you can't just jump into the TIFMIS world. Um, let me back up one. So the way the progression starts is these deployable members, they're called Firefighter 1 and 2. You have to open a task book for that rank. And it you have to spend hundreds of hours completing that task book. You actually have to go on deployment. So you are a, you're a firefighter trainee first. And you have to do that for a period of time and then you'll open up a engine boss task book. Same thing, you have to do pack testing. That pack test is where it's a physical fitness test that shows that you can make it on an actual wildfire event. Uh, you have to take certification courses from the Texas Forest Service. Um, there is a whole lot to go into each one of these ranks. That's why as you see it tears up, there's less and less people that are um, at those higher ranks. So a lot goes into it and it should. It keeps people safe. This is a, a thank you back to council. Uh, our bunker gear project, if y'all remember last year, y'all approved for this project to be fully funded. Uh, we now have two complete firefighter ensembles for every member of, of the fire department. We've also installed uh, a bunker gear dryer at every fire station and then also an extractor, which is a firefighter bunker gear washing machine. It is a... Um, special machine to pull the pull the liquid out of the fibers of the bunker gear without destroying them so but thank you council for fully funding this and uh, this program is closed down now training center uh, this is a program that I, I i just got finished telling you that i'm really excited about and actually really proud of the success we had last year we hosted two regional area schools for our local volunteer community we just finished one up um, last month, uh, it was a vehicle tech two extrication class, and some of those pictures are actually on this uh, slide. Um, and by the fall of 2024, we will be offering our, our first basic fire academy to outside students. We talk about generating revenue. If we allow outside students to come into our academy, they will pay for us to do that. Okay, we are already teaching our students, so. It doesn't cost us any more to teach one or two or three or five more students, but we have the benefit of generating a little bit of revenue uh, for that service. Um, What's the revenue? So that question's kind of still up in the air because some of these um, other departments or some of these other educational facilities offer a 100% online course at an extremely reduced price because they get reimbursements back, back from the state to offer that fire academy. Well, with us doing face-to-face, -face, we haven't quite decided on exactly what the tuition would be per student. It's somewhere between $2,500 to $5,000 per student, with the potential of having 20 to 30 students per class. Eh, no, that's too much. Not until I get my training center additional classroom. That's what I mean by busting at the seams. Um, we could probably realistically do 15 to 20 fire students at one time. And if you have 20 of those students outside, there's a potential for a large amount of revenue. Can't make any promises because we're not there yet. So Currently, what do you have for revenue? 
building. Oh, how much revenue have we generated? Well, the fall of 24 will be the first out outside class for the fire the academy. The other trainings that you have done. Oh, okay. So like that vehicle extrication class, we had yeah. 20 students from the outside the area and they, um, the cost for the course was $400 a student. And of course we have some overhead costs, overtime for my personnel, food costs for the students, and uh, just some general operating expenses. Well, we netted about $6,000 for the course. Over a three day weekend, we netted, netted about $6,000. Well, I have a huge need out of the training academy and no way to fund that need, which is to put up a fence around the property. Well, I don't think $6,000 is gonna be able to cover a fence to, to surround the property but it's gonna certainly take care of $6,000 of that expense. So found an additional $6,000 to help us with that budgetary problem that we have. So. Even not to mention heads and beds, people staying here in our community. Oh, absolutely, we brought, we well. brought uh, um, people from outside of our community, came all the way down from South Texas down by Houston. We had students from all the way down there, had a couple out of the panhandle. So um, not to food, uh, restaurants, so. Um, the next point on here that we acquired an aircraft prop, one of the goals that I had last year was to acquire an aircraft prop. And this just kind of fell in our lap um, and it cost us next to nothing. It's, you know, this is a firefighter prop that is plumbed with propane and it's all rudimentary steel and it kind of looks like an aircraft. And right now we have the prop, now we just gotta find the funding to put it into, put it into place. And the very next item that we purchased an American Airlines aircraft, that one truly did fall in our laps. Uh, we were reached out to by a carrier that wanted to sell us this aircraft for about 35,000. Well, do some negotiations one way to another. We ended up getting it delivered for less than $6,000. So what, what would we use an airplane for? I, I don't have a pilot's license. I'm not going to be flying back and forth. This this aircraft was decommissioned, wings taken off of it. It is used for uh, our aircraft rescue firefighting training for search and rescue within the fuselage. Of the, it's one of the uh, objectives of getting that certification that we have to have for our aircraft personnel. So a lot of really excited things going on at the Training Academy. Uh, looking forward to the growth and the expansion of the services provided out there. We've got a lot of great people out there and they're motivated to make this successful. Okay, so my next slide. Sorry, so my next slide, this is a coverage map of San Angelo and uh, you recognize the red line is the city limits um, within the city and each one of the blue circles is a three mile um, diameter circle and the center point is a fire station and you can look for the most part the city of san angelo has got pretty decent coverage with fire stations with one fairly glaring exception um right if I can get right there okay that is south of town right on grand canal and what's important about this is that area is more than five road miles from the closest fire station. So fire station, fire station, why won't this thing move? Okay, so fire station seven, which is just immediately north to that area, fire station four, which is northeast of that area out on Chadburn or the north or south gate of Goodfellow Air Force Base, and then fire station eight, which is out by the airport, which is um, southwest of that area. Each one of those stations is greater than five road miles from this area. And more importantly, the closest fire station is more than seven, seven minute response. So this next video, it's actually a video that was put together for, for, by Underwriter Laboratories. And it was based on some research from the Fire Service Research Institute. And the video illustrates, Tina, I don't know if I can push it. There's like a play button at the bottom. I was worried this would happen. Oh, did you see it? That little play button. So uh, what this video illustrates is a, it's a comparison of two separate rooms. 
And in these two rooms, you have a legacy room, which basically is furniture that is pre-1950s. Heavy wood, cotton fiber, burns slow, does not burn very hot. And on the right side of this video, you're going to see what is a modern room, okay? Basically what we encounter today, day to day. Both of these fires are started at the exact same time with the same size flame. And what you're going to see is initially the natural fibers, the, the legacy room, is going to start, and it's going to start to burn real fast. But I want you all to pay attention to the smoke production, because that is what is lethal inside a fire. Smoke production and that time counter. Now, this is time-lapsed, and it has picked up this, the speed of the time. But the, the two-minute timeline, that is the actual real time. It's just sped up, so we don't have to sit here for 20 minutes to watch a video. So at the two and a half minute mark, you've got heavy smoke production in the top of the, the, right, the right room. Within three minutes, you have leaf, lethal amounts of smoke in the top of the room. This is still survivable. This is still, people could still occupy this space. But in a very short time, a fire doubles in size every minute. I'm glad I have all natural. Then I have to hurry. I can be in that seven-minute response. Well, I will spot. tell you that if you've replaced your carpet in the last 50 years, or replaced your uh, drapes in the last 50 years, or your couch in the last 50 years, you have the the modern. Um, you do have the modern furnishings. Okay, and uh, they're heavy plastic lading. They're full of carcinogens. They're full of. Uh, um, styro or foams, polyurethanes, polystyrenes, and they, they burn at twice the rate as natural, uh, natural fibers. The reason why I selected this video is the important note of time to flashover. Flashover is an unsurvivable condition. That's when everything within that space instantly catches on fire. And I don't know if y'all y'all saw in that video where there's a point where a bunch of stuff was on fire and then everything was on fire. That's flashover. It's unsurvivable for occupants, and it's also unsurvivable for firefighter and turnout gear that are, and we are protected. What was the time on that, that flashover? Four minutes, Four 50. 50 seconds. What's the closest fire station to that neighborhood that I just showed you? But on the other neighborhoods, you know, we got it at seven minutes, five miles. Right. But in, for example, at the one at the top, the very top. The north? And then to the east, what would be the east to me on this? It could be to the west on you. Are you referring? I'm re up here. Up. Up, up. Up there? Over, over, to the right, to my right, right in here. Yes, ma'am. What's the time frame in there? So that circle, that is a three-mile rate. Uh, it's actually a, a half, mile and a half radius. It's a three-mile diameter. Thank you, Tina. Is so, that where you're talking about? That? Yeah, go further oh, north and then to the right. I will tell you, a, uh, a consultant did a comparison for the entire city of San Angelo, and there is only one neighborhood that's greater than five road miles away from a fire station, and that's that southern district that I showed you. Right, and but that, I want to know what it is in this upper corner, because it looks like a lot of space and room, and it would look like it would be greater than five miles based off of this diagram and that diagram. Well, that's a map. So from the center of that dot to the edge of that blue line, That's a mile and a half. So from the center of that dot is where the fire station is located. Straight out, the radius of that is a mile and a half. And what makes it so difficult down here on the south sector of town is in Station 8 is actually fairly close, but the lake is right between them and that neighborhood. So they have to go all the way around South Concho Drive. Remember, it's five road miles. Okay. And when you ever go a little bit north for Station five, 7 and Station 4, which is directly north and northeast on Chadburn, they have a fairly, fairly uh, straight shot to that neighborhood, except it's just that far away. So Southgate Church of Christ is actually right off of that 277 interchange right there. That is within five miles. Okay, but as you come around Grand Canal and go over into that Pinehurst and that Country Club Lake Estates area and the brand new subdivision that was added on onto Ratliff Road, those are outside that five mile, is that five road miles. Road within the city limits. According to this map, it is not, but we just annexed that in about four months ago, five months ago. It has not been that long since we annexed Ratliff Road in. 
that whole development. It might be TJ, but it's not Annex. No, it's yeah. it's Annex. It, it, it's it, yeah, it was we Annex, did. yes, ma'am. Yeah, that. we did. They added somewhere around 230 homes are being constructed out there on the south side of Grand Canal, and all that area has been annexed. And it's seven and a half minute response time for our closest unit. So that's the takeaways from that video. Unsurvivable conditions after four and a half minutes or four minutes and 50 seconds. And um, we're, by the time we arrive on scene, we're significantly behind the power curve and we're set up for failure at that point. And if there is a fire in that area, it's going to be a defensive fire because the, the fire will have a stronghold on that property and <laughs> interior uh, offensive operations won't be, um, <coughs> I'm sorry. Interior. You need um, water? <laughs> nah, I'm fine. Video? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's smoke from the video. I told you it was bad. So uh, uh, interior operations will not be feasible at that point when we arrive on sink. So uh, we do absolutely need a ninth fire station in, in the southern district of San Angelo. Oh, come on. Okay, good. So let's focus on 2024. Some of the things that uh, are high on the priority uh, is fire, appar fire apparatus capital allocation. And I touched on that when we were going over CIP. Uh, last year I spoke on, on this subject regarding how we receive about 250, or we receive $250,000 a year for capital allocation. We cash flow all of our apparatus to avoid any kind of uh, uh, lending, borrowing fees. Um, I just received a quote for a new fire engine, and it is just a touch over $800,000 for just a regular fire engine. And uh, with an allocation of twenty-five dollars or $250,000, it's going to take greater than three years to play, replace one truck. We have 10 vehicles in our fleet. It will take 30 years to completely replace our fleet. So National Fire Protection Agency recommends a 10-year replacement period. Well, we have pushed that. Why? Because we have a fairly robust ma a maintenance program, and we also have a, a reduction in call volume. So we can afford to push that out to 15 years, but we can't afford to push it out to 30 years. I don't know anybody in the room that wants a 30-year-old fire truck showing up to their house, right? And we have four of them. We have four 30-year-old vehicles in our fleet, and I'm hoping by the end of this year I can sell those off and replace them, hoping to. So again, that figure needs to, honestly, if 250,000 produces 30 year, if you double that figure, you'll reduce the th 30 year to a 15. So we realistically need that figure to be 500 to 550. So I know funding's tough, but if we don't take steps now, we're gonna be in a real bind soon. So uh, another thing I'd like to see is uh, secure the funding to, be, to begin a health and wellness initiative. And well, more how much healthier are you going to get those? <laughs> 98%. I mean, we are athletes, is what we are. <laughs> so, what I mean by that more specifically is not a health and wellness initiative, but to take care of our own. Technology has increased so much in the last 10 years. There is now a, a test that uh, a person, a firefighter, can take where they can detect cancer in its very early stages. So firefighters are nine times more likely to develop cancer and 14 times more likely to die from cancer than an average uh, citizen. Why? Because of all the carcinogens that we encounter in our day-to-day -day lives. The PFOS, they're in the firefighter foams. The PFOSs that are in our bunker gear that we put on our bodies every day we go to work. We have, we have the technology to test for cancer at its early stages. And y'all all know Chief Dunn, he was lucky. He caught his cancer at stage two. I think he was stage two. He's a survivor of cancer because of that. If we can catch one person, if we can catch one cancer in its early stages, it'll pay for this entire program. So how much does it cost? Body scans are $500 per person. 60 people, 60 people per year. 60 people per year. That came through. It's $30,000 annually. We have 180 personnel. In a three-year period, every single member of this department will have a cancer treatment. And then you repeat the process, and you repeat the process. Um, so that's, that's a huge initiative that I would see, I'd love to see happen. I know we've asked for it for multiple years in a row. I would really love to see that happen this year. Um, a big one, 
that I just covered was to acquire the land for fire station number nine. Uh, my goal for fire station number nine is to have it ribbon cutting ceremony five years from now. That's our target, five years to have that station purchased, built, and moved into in five years. And I know it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of money. Step one is to get the land, and I'm actively working on securing that land. Uh, secure the funding for a training center expansion. I, I kind of told you that we are busting at the seams. I want to expand into um, offering um, EMS out there. Currently, we, uh, we partner up with Howard College, and we have to use Howard College's, uh, Howard College's lab. I don't have a lab at the fire or over at the training academy. Um, I want to run fire and EMS simultaneously so I can potentially shorten my recruit academy where I can have one group of recruits going through fire school and another group, group of recruits going through EMS school so I overlap my academies so I reduce that 15-month turnaround time down to about 12-month turnaround time. So, and that's in training. So, that's all I have. If y'all have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer any. Tom? Patrick? Yes, sir. When you take these old units out, is there any residual value to them? No. And you wouldn't talk pennies on the dollar. That's even a joke. So ladder, ladder seven, if y'all remember about three years ago, uh, we replaced that ladder seven with a new aerial. Beautiful truck, by the way. Thank y'all. Um, we took ladder seven, put it through the auction. Um, we got $2,500 for that truck at the auction. The aluminum in the ladder was worth more than $2,500. The engine... Even if the engine had to be rebuilt, it was worth 20, more than $2,500. But we're, we're kind of bound by sending it through auction. I have looked into a couple options, firefighter truck options, but still, it's pennies on the dollar. I checked with our, um, one of the vendors. Do you all take trade-ins? Yes. Well, how much would you give me for a 1992 Pierce Dash? Because that's what I have. He goes, about 2500 I guess everything's worth twenty five hundred dollars. I don't know. Well, the, than zero. There's a point of you know law of diminishing returns. It's yes. kind of like trading a truck. Do you want to ride it all the way to the end, or do when you get four years on them, do you want to spend them when you still get half your equity out? I mean, those are things we need to look at and analyze. It's obvious that you're going to need some help. Try to get back up and getting compliance on there. I just it's one of those things we we don't have a lot of wiggle room with compromising safety, and we and we understand that. But I was just trying to get a picture on what you need and quick and so I, I told sooner or later I told you next week that I was going to come to council with a recommendation to move forward with the purchase of another engine well talk about revenue generation engine eight I'm bringing all, bringing to council for y'all because we were not in a position to purchase engine eight engine eight is a 17 uh, year old unit okay it is due for replacement and I didn't have the money last year Council was gracious enough, finance was gracious enough to throw an extra $200,000 into my capital allocation. I still don't have enough money. But because of the participation in the TIFMAS program, we're able to buy that truck two years ahead of schedule. That is huge for our taxpayers, huge for city council. That relieved the burden of two more years of us waiting for that vehicle. Because it's already two years out of date. Now, I would love to be able to count on that TIFMAS money every single year, but if you look outside, it's rainy, it's cool, and nothing's burning. <laughs> so okay. I, I can't count on TIFMAS money year after year after year, and that's why I talk to you all about I need that guaranteed <coughs> capital allocation because that TIFMAS is not always going to be there to bail us out. But yes, sir, Tom. Thank you, Patrick. No, thank you, sir. Any other questions? Sir, do you have a question? Manpower? So we're good for now. But in the very short time, so in March, I hired six personnel, and I hired six above my Manning. I had 180 people, and I hired six additional people. I'm author no, I, let me correct myself. I had 178 people, and I hired six additional people, so I'm six over. Why? Because I've had four people drop their papers in the last week. <laughs> so one, one person retired. <laughs> And um, I had one person turned in his uh, retirement paperwork and three people quit to seek employment other places, completely away from the fire, fire, fire department. That one hurts. It's one thing to leave the fire department to go somewhere else and make more money with the fire department because this is our passion and our dream and our life. 
but to give it up to go to another industry entirely tells me it was about one thing, pay. Pay and schedule, and that's a tough thing for me risk. to hear. Yeah, and risk, absolutely. So um, by September of this year, I'll be back to even, and um, I still have an active list. I intend on hiring off of that list because it takes 12 to 14 months to get these recruits to the academy. I'm going to offer another test. From what I understand, we already have 30 people signed up for the next test. Um, actually, my recruiter is sitting right back there, and he does a fantastic job getting me applicants. So, <laughs> anyways, uh, we, we've had more applicants in the last two years. On, not more than what we've had in the previous years, but what we have seen is a slight increase in applicants showing up to the test. Why? Because we're showing up to the schools for um, um, career day. We're blasting social media. Uh, uh, Brian Groves is helping us out with making a video, and we're blowing up social media with uh, San Angelo Fire Department is hiring. We're, we took out Google ads. We're showing up to the mall. We're doing a bunch of these PR events where people see us, especially at the schools. Because that is our future, is those young people in high school and junior high. Um, we are doing a lot of PR <laughs> events where we're getting our name out there. So I think that's why in the last couple of years we've seen a slight increase in, in um, um, right, a recruitment of, of, of personnel. And this last group, we had a lot of very, very qualified applicants, and I was very pleased with it. So. Any other questions? You're welcome.